This is a special presentation of ABC News. The Persian Gulf, images of a conflict. It is early August, 1990. One Arab nation invades and conquers another. It is the prelude to war. The situation inside Kuwait is serious. They have occupied all the important uh, facilities in Kuwait. And then there was sporadic street fighting. This is the British Embassy in Kuwait. It is very dangerous to venture out. They are commanding the whole country with their fingers. Has requested our government to assist it to establish security and order. On the Persian Gulf, this is what Kuwait City looks like from a satellite. The Iraqis came from the northeast on the night of August the 2nd. There was little resistance. The Iraqis swept through town and out onto the coast road. They turned their tanks south, 80 miles of open country along the Gulf to the border with Saudi Arabia. Kuwait City, the morning of the invasion, seen through the eyes of an amateur camera person. The Kuwaitis had never believed it possible, even when Iraq massed 100,000 men on the frontier. But the Iraqis were making no mistake about it. They came by land and by sea and by air. Let's review for a moment some of the reasons why, from Saddam Hussein's point of view, he might have wanted to invade Kuwait. For one thing, modern Iraq never had a decent access to the Persian Gulf. It was the British who drew all of these modern boundaries. In fact, it was the British High Commissioner in Baghdad who drew, in the 1920s, the modern borders between Iraq and Kuwait. He, he took a red pencil, literally, and with it he denied Iraq access to the sea, which has had an awful lot to do with Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. There's a waterway called the Shat al-Arab here between Iran and Iraq, over which they fought for much of the last eight years. But now that the war is over, the waterway is either silted up or full of wrecked ships. Now, the war between Iraq and Iran cost Saddam Hussein a fortune. At the beginning of the war, he had $30 billion in cash. At the end of the war, he was $100 billion in debt. So by invading Kuwait, he hoped to get his hands on Kuwaiti assets, not least of which was all the oil. What kind of a man is this who would crush a neighbor like he would an insect? What kind of a man would lie to his friends, Egypt and Jordan? What kind of a man would be perfectly willing to let the world condemn him as long as it doesn't stop him? The Saddam Hussein we saw in Baghdad was not a ranting madman. He was articulate, calculating, and cold. His handshake was quick and careless. In the three hours we spent with him, he never laughed out loud. He never raised his voice. It was the icy calm and coherence of a man who has spent more than 20 years looking into the mirror of his ambition. When we traveled to Iraq just six weeks ago to talk to the president, we had no idea that tonight Saddam Hussein would be threatening to bring the Mideast into war. From the moment you set foot in Iraq, he is everywhere. The artists who make these paintings are said to put a drop of their own blood in the paint. Children are taught to sing songs like Saddam, Saddam, victorious, our beloved. You carry the nation's dawn between your eyes. With us, Hussein was not the least bit apologetic or embarrassed. He said he has transformed the country. He is modern Iraq. The, I understand the criticism that some of the Western people in the West may issue about such phenomena. But Saddam Hussein is present in any quantity of milk given to a child and is present in any clean or new jacket that an Iraqi may wear. And Saddam Hussein is present also in the decision that uh, brought back the oil revenues to the Iraqis after they had gone to the foreigners for a long time. Which is one of his justifications for seizing Kuwait, that real Arabs wouldn't let so much oil revenue get into pro-Western hands. We call for the immediate and unconditional withdrawal of all the Iraqi forces. There is no place for this sort of naked aggression in today's world. 
But before he departed for Colorado, the president ordered an across-the-board halt to all U.S. trade, including oil purchases, with Iraq. He also froze Iraqi assets in the U.S. as punishment, and he did the same for Kuwaiti assets for the opposite reason, to protect them. He also sent Secretary of State Baker to Moscow, where it was expected there would be an unprecedented joint U.S.-Soviet statement condemning the invasion tomorrow. Several hours later, after meeting with Mrs. Thatcher, the two leaders came out and declared their support for further action by the U.N. None of us can do it separately. We need a collective and effective will of the nations belonging to the United Nations. At the U.N., U.S. Ambassador Thomas Pickering urged passage of a stiff set of sanctions. Iraq must learn that its disregard for international law will have crippling political and economic costs. Kuwait's ambassador, not surprisingly, supported the action, calling the Security Council the conscience of the world. Iraq accused the U.S. of treating the U.N. as its own foreign ministry. The vote was 13 to 0 for the resolution, with Cuba and Yemen abstaining. The measure outlaws virtually all trade and aid to Iraq by the UN's 159 member nations. Only medical supplies are exempt. If such an embargo held, it would starve Iraq's economy dependent on oil exports. Good evening. The President of the United States is determined. The Iraqi President Saddam Hussein is defiant. The United States says that Iraqi forces on the frontier of Saudi Arabia are in a menacing posture. And so President Bush has decided that U.S. forces will go to Saudi Arabia. The Saudis are clearly worried, nervous enough to let the U.S. military on to Saudi territory. And by doing so, they risk inciting Iraq and losing support from other Arab states. In one of the most unpredictable parts of the world, the political and military implications of all this are dangerous. U.S. troops leaving for Saudi Arabia. Kuwait under siege. More threats from Saddam Hussein. Quote, we would rather die than be humiliated, and we will pluck the eyes of those who attack the Arab nation. Today, President Bush paid a morale-boosting visit to the CIA. He's been praising its work since the invasion of Kuwait began. We have good intelligence, and our intelligence has had me concerned for some time here about what action might be taken. A few days later, Mr. Bush let on how intelligence was continuing to operate. Iraqi lied once again. They said they were going to start moving out today, and we have no evidence that they're moving out. According to reports, satellite pictures gave analysts the kind of detailed information they needed to track the steady march of more and more Iraqi troops to the border. Remember, a source says, we've been following troop movements for 35 years. It's a precise science. A line has been drawn in the sand. The United States has taken a firm position. This is a special report from ABC News. In the life of a nation, we're called upon to define who we are and what we believe. Sometimes these choices are not easy. But today as president, I ask for your support in the decision I've made to stand up for what's right and condemn what's wrong, all in the cause of peace. At my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division as well as key units of the United States Air Force are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. I took this action to assist the Saudi Arabian government in the defense of its homeland. No one commits America's armed forces to a dangerous mission lightly, but after perhaps unparalleled international consultation and exhausting every alternative, it became necessary to take this action. We seek the immediate, unconditional, and complete withdrawal of all Iraqi forces from Kuwait. Second, Kuwait's legitimate government must be restored to replace the puppet regime. And third, my administration, has been, as has been the case with every president, from President Roosevelt to President Reagan, is committed to the security and stability of the Persian Gulf. Ever since Roosevelt, every American president has taken the position that Persian Gulf oil is crucial to national security, but that relying on it leaves America vulnerable. We will have developed the potential to meet our own energy needs without depending on any foreign energy sources. Declare our energy independence will be the moral equivalent of war. Never again 
held hostage by the whim of any country or cartel. We cannot and will not wait for the next energy crisis to force us to respond. When President Bush said that, it was a year before Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. To have that individual setting himself up as the leader, the new OPEC czar, is a threat not just to the United States. I think that, that he was clearly heading for establishing his own controls over oil prices on a significant amount of the uh, uh, oil production in the world. The Pentagon pushed ahead today with Operation Desert Shield, the biggest U.S. military deployment since the war in Vietnam. Within a month, it is expected that 50,000 troops, maybe more, will be in or around the Persian Gulf. The Pentagon says a brigade of around 2,300 troops will accompany tanks, armored personnel carriers, and field artillery to Saudi Arabia. First stop today was the port of Savannah, where the equipment brought by truck and train was being loaded onto ships. Family members left behind are worried, especially about Iraq's threat to use chemical weapons against American soldiers. Yeah, that scares the heck out of you. Sure it does. Because once something starts, you don't know where it's going to end. It's scary. We don't know what's going to happen there. <laughs> this is a special report from ABC News. We've had a chance in the last few minutes to hear what the Iraqi President Saddam Hussein is thinking. We'd anticipated that he himself might appear on television this morning. In fact, he sent a spokesman, and anybody looking for compromise is going to be gravely disappointed. He accused the Saudis, uh, and this is a very serious accusation in the Middle East, giving up control of the holy places, Mecca and Medina, making them hostage to the Americans and to the Zionists. He said, burn the land under the feet of the aggressor, hit them wherever they can. He tries in this speech this morning to turn it around, the United States, supported as always in Arab eyes by Israel, is the aggressor and Iraq, in his view, is now on the defense. The crisis in the Persian Gulf intensified today as Egyptian and Moroccan troops began arriving in Saudi Arabia to join U.S. forces already there. The exact number of Egyptian troops was not announced. But for many years, Egyptian and American troops have held joint exercises in the Egyptian desert. Their purpose? to be ready to answer any threat to the world's oil supplies in the Persian Gulf. Mubarak reflected his profound and pessimistic feelings when he was asked if a peaceful solution to the crisis would be found. His response in Arabic, I am always optimistic, but frankly, I tell you, there is no hope. I wish there was. Mubarak also met today with Syrian President Assad. Though he has been an implacable opponent of Washington, Assad has decided that his old enemy, Iraq, is a greater and more immediate threat. The Egyptians say Syria, too, will send troops to the Gulf. Saddam Hussein succeeded this week in proving that the world is far different now that the Cold War is over, and that Arab unity is little more than a myth. In Cairo, at the Arab summit meeting, anyone who thought some face-saving way would be found for Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait needed only listen to Iraq's foreign minister. We are not going to negotiate anything here under the American intimidation. But it was American diplomacy that worked. The heart of the Arab League lined up against Saddam Hussein in a bitter session where Iraqis reportedly threw plates of food at Kuwaitis. Then a majority of the 21-member Arab League voted to send troops to help defend Saudi Arabia. And the League passed a tough resolution which not only condemned the invasion, but endorsed the United Nations economic sanctions against Arab brother Iraq. The Iraqi leader wants to destabilize the regimes which are now confronting him by pitting poor Arabs against the regimes wealthy from oil. Demonstrators in some countries, like Jordan, were inspired by Saddam Hussein's rhetoric, and that helped raise the specter of terrorism. But in Washington, the focus was on the diplomatic success. While the United States may still have to lead, militarily and diplomatically, now there are a surprising number of nations who find it is in their best interest, as well as the world's, to go along. While voices were raised in caution, none, save Saddam Hussein's, condemned the U.S. decision to send troops and to send ships that could enforce the embargo. British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher encouraged President Bush and sent air units. In Paris, President Mitterrand, who refused to let U.S. planes fly over France on their way to Libya in 1986, dispatched naval forces. Other NATO countries, which often refuse to do America's bidding on terrorism, pledged this time to help. We are demonstrating, I think, that in a new era, we can work together in dealing with threats from new sources and from new directions. 
even Japan joined the embargo. Prime Minister Kaifu abandoning the oil-first diplomacy practiced by his government and its predecessors. Even with the administration's diplomatic success, it is still a risky venture. Though a few Americans made it out of Iraq to Jordan this weekend, the biggest risk of all may be faced by the more than 3,000 still trapped in Iraq and Kuwait. The administration refuses to use the word hostage, but it does acknowledge that by any name, they pose the greatest policy dilemma for the administration. And with more than 100,000 Iraqi troops massed in Kuwait and along its border with Saudi Arabia, military experts say it would be folly for the United States to become involved in a land war with Iraq. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Just a couple of hours ago, ABC's Ted Koppel became the first Western journalist to arrive in Baghdad since the crisis began. His first stop was the Iraqi Foreign Ministry. Just a few minutes ago, we talked on the telephone. Ted, can we go first to the uh, status of Americans in Iraq and Kuwait? Have you picked up anything on that? Uh, indeed, I have, Peter. I should point out to you that immediately upon arrival in Baghdad, we drove at 90 miles an hour down a three-lane highway and were taken uh, immediately to the foreign ministry. The Iraqi numbers on the Americans in Kuwait uh, are about 3,000, they claim, and they say there are some four to 500 Americans here in Baghdad. I raised with him the question of whether, in fact, they were hostages. It is not a word that the Iraqis like to use, but the official conceded to me that even though all of the Americans, he said, are being well-treated and well-housed and that they are in no immediate danger, nevertheless, they were not free to leave. He called them restrictees and made the point that their exit from Iraq is going to be restricted until this crisis is over. President Bush said in the news conference a while ago that King Hussein of Jordan was on his way here to see him, and the speculation is here that he is carrying a message from Saddam Hussein in Baghdad. Do you know if Saddam Hussein is trying to send President Bush a message? The headline of that message would be uh, that King Hussein is carrying word from Saddam Hussein that it is still not too late to talk. I must tell you, it is my very strong impression that the Iraqis are genuinely afraid that the United States has moved into Saudi Arabia for the express purpose of invading Iraq. President Bush said he sees no hope of a diplomatic breakthrough in the Gulf until Iraq has time to feel the bite of economic sanctions. I don't see it right now, but as the sanctions begin to take effect, it's going to take a while, uh, I would hope there would be. Despite complaints by such allies as France and Canada that the U.S. cannot act alone, the president said the U.S. Navy will continue to interdict all shipments in and out of Iraq. I think we're acting legally. Merchant vessel, Hayden, this is U.S. Navy warship. I understand your flag is Iraqi and your destination is Singapore, is that correct? Yes, sir. Hello. The international boycott was being observed in parts of the Gulf. This Iraqi cargo ship, the al -Abid, along with the sister ship, were denied permission to enter an Arab port in the lower Gulf. Our jobs, our way of life, our own freedom, and the freedom of friendly countries around the world would all suffer if control of the world's great oil reserves fell into the hands of that one man, Saddam Hussein. It is Saddam Hussein who lied to his Arab neighbors. It is Saddam who invaded an Arab state, and it is he who now threatens the Arab nation, and we, by contrast, seek to assist our Arab friends in their hour of need. And Saddam has claimed that this is a holy war of Arab against infidel. This, from the man who has used poison gas against the men and women and children of his own country. We must ensure that no goods get in and that not one drop of oil gets out. This is ABC News Nightline, reporting from Baghdad, Iraq, Ted Koppel. We are the first American journalists allowed into Iraq since the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Tonight, I'll have an exclusive interview with the Iraqi foreign minister. This morning, I visited uh, the hotel where some 36 Americans are being held against their will. Uh, I frankly don't understand, and indeed all the other Americans who are here are also being kept in the country 
against their will. Some of them would voluntarily stay. I don't quite understand, Mr. Foreign Minister, on what basis, let's start with the 36 Americans who are at the hotel, on what basis they are being restricted to that hotel. Oh, I said that this uh, measure is a temporary precautionary measure. I cannot elaborate on that at the moment. We might say more in the, in the near future about it, but I pledge that they will be safe and no harm will affect them. There is, for example, one family. I talked to the father this morning. He has a six-month-old baby boy who has a hernia condition. He has a six-year-old daughter. And, of course, his wife is with him. Uh, I must tell you, uh, I doubt that there are very many people in the United States who can understand. Is there any reason that you can cite why they should be held against no, the I, I, why, why I they hear the story home? for the first time. Now we are on, on, on the TV. Even if, I, if you didn't raise it, if the American officials and the embassy raised it with our ministry, we would have looked at the matter with, uh, uh, with positive response. I would immediately take care of that and see what can we do. Are you telling me that those children will be released? Well, it is not in the power of the foreign minister to decide on their release. That's what I was asking you. Yeah, yeah, but go. I am a member of the government, and I can uh, ask my colleagues who are in charge of this uh, matter to, to handle it, because I know the intentions of my government. You see, we don't have any hostile intentions against those people. We don't want them to, to be harmed by any, any reason. You've said you, you've said you can ask them. Uh, forgive me for pressing you. Will you ask them? I will, of course. Thank you, sir. This is a special report from ABC News. At the State Department, ABC's David Ensworth. David, the American ambassador in Kuwait, was called at about 10 o'clock in the morning there. What was he told? He was told, Peter, by the Iraqi general in charge of the occupation forces that for their own safety, Americans should all move to the Kuwait International Hotel, which is right opposite the U.S. Embassy in downtown Kuwait City. The, uh, the uh, general suggested, no, no specific threat, but suggested, officials say, that if the Americans don't go there voluntarily, the Iraqi troops may move them there uh, with force. A lot of concern, too, and a lot of attention devoted to the 36 Americans in the Iraqi capital, Baghdad, who've been staying at a very fancy El Rashid Hotel in Baghdad, who are being called by the Iraqis the restrictees, called by us, in many cases, the detainees. ABC's Forrest Sawyer is in Baghdad just a couple of minutes ago. I asked him what he knew of those American restrictees today. Basically, Peter, I can tell you this is the worst day that they have had since they have been incarcerated at the hotel. For the first time, Iraq has barred the U.S. consul from going by for his daily talk with them, so contact with the outside world is now effectively cut off. The other news, of course, today from Baghdad is the speech uh, made in the name of President Saddam Hussein in response to the very tough speech uh, that President Bush made at the Pentagon yesterday in which he was uh, very rough on Saddam Hussein, uh, characterized by almost every analyst we've talked to today as about as rough as he could get on the Iraqi leader. And Saddam Hussein today, who accused President Bush of being a liar and of not telling the American people why uh, the United States had gone into the Persian Gulf, also said, we pray that the two sides will not clash because if they do, thousands of Americans whom you have pushed into this dark tunnel will go home shrouded in sad coffins. It is that tension and that uh, rhetoric and that danger which has been on the mind of King Hussein of Jordan. And he came here, you know, basically at his own invitation to see President Bush, uh, very concerned that the United States didn't understand, in his words, President Hussein of Iraq, and almost desperately concerned of the position of his own country. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, reporting live from Amman, Jordan. This is a day which began in the Iraqi capital of Baghdad. A day on which we brought out the first videotape since the current crisis began of life, political activity, and the ever-present image of Saddam Hussein. The mood toward Americans in the Iraqi capital shifted today. For the first time since this crisis began, there were demonstrations in front of the U.S. Embassy. Approximately a hundred Palestinian women carrying posters of Saddam Hussein and PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat milled about in the street while the Iraqi security detail assigned to protect the embassy watched the demonstration. The only violence was rhetorical. 
Insults were hurled at Arab leaders aligned with the United States. Mubarak of Egypt, the ousted leadership of Kuwait, the royal family of Saudi Arabia. The women chanted, we are with you, Saddam, to the last drop of blood. A senior Iraqi official said tonight that Iraq will hold all foreigners from, quote, aggressive nations until the threat of war against the, their country ends. That presumably includes the 3,000 Americans held in Iraq and Kuwait. The Iraqi news agency said tonight the detained Westerners will be housed at key civil and military installations, in other words, perhaps used as human shields in case of attack. One of these Americans is Michael Nickman from Nebraska, who expressed his fears in a recent secret interview with Nightline correspondent Forrest Sawyer in Baghdad. What are you worried about? Well, um, I guess just for our safety of getting out of here, uh, I would like to leave, I guess. Uh, as long as there's anything possible to happen here, I would rather be out of here. The Bosner family were among the Americans held prisoner at the El Rashid Hotel in Baghdad. Their plight is all the more serious because their six-month-old son, David, has a hernia condition. Uh, yesterday, when I heard about them being detained, all Americans being detained, I, it was almost like this profound grief just overwhelmed me. I felt that I had really lost some ground, or we had lost ground, because we had so many people working for the family to get these people released. There are about 10,000 Westerners, including Germans, French, and British citizens. Of that, some 3,000 are Americans. Tonight's announcement from Baghdad could have profound impact on American Michael Nickman and others held by the Iraqis. What's, uh, what's the worst thing about Just a waiting and not knowing what's going to happen. That's probably the worst. We all watched with interest your interview earlier this week with uh, Iraq's foreign minister, in which he said that uh, the Americans in Iraq were only going to be there temporarily, temporarily. How can we believe them? What do you think this latest development means? Well, uh, first of all, it means we can't believe them. And secondly, it means that all this nonsense about using euphemisms like detainees and restrictees uh, is, as I suggested from Amman last night, something that belongs in the garbage can. These people are hostages. They're being treated like hostages, and they're going to be used like hostages. Mr. Ambassador, uh, that, do I you... Think... Please let me ask my question. Uh, okay. We have reports tonight that the Americans are indeed being put in various parts of the country, in strategic places, on bases, that they're no longer in one place. Can you confirm that, that they have indeed well, been taken to different places in Kuwait and Iraq? There are so many rumors, and people here, as soon as one jump with one news item, everybody jumps and and uh, began to circulate it and print it and talk about it without having the real facts. But two instance. days ago, these people were in hotels and, they, and the residents were in their homes. Where are they now? Barbara, why don't you talk about more serious This things? is very about, serious. No, they're no, very we, serious. We'd like no, to know where these Westerners are. Why can't you just confirm or deny what your own news agency well, has I just, just reported? Look, I just, on my way, I heard it. You don't expect me now, I go to the, to go and find out uh, at this hour, late at night. Uh, aren't you in, in contact at all with your government? Well, I wasn't in contact in the evening. This happened many hours ago. This happened in early afternoon, well, our time. Well, I have other business. Sorry, I, so I told you, I don't have to give you excuse why I didn't check with my government, do I? So you have no, at this point, sir, you have no information on the Westerners no, in no, your I country don't. or in Kuwait? No, no. Mr. Ambassador, just let the record show two things. First of all, you're giving us assurance about the safety of people uh, whose whereabouts you know nothing about, as you've just conceded to us. But Se I speak second, about principle. Secondly, I speak of a principle. Mr. Ambassador, we, it's precisely, we, it's we precisely the, Arabs, the principle we have, that we're discussing we have, here. We have high value to, to protect uh, our guests. We have high value to, to protect our guests. Uh, this is a high Arab value. Yes, well, since, uh, since you were accusing me of engaging in polemics a moment ago, let me just for the sake of the record point out that what precipitated this crisis was not Americans going to Saudi Arabia, but the Iraqi government invading Kuwait, which preceded well, that event. Yeah, well, who, who authorized you to go there and uh, build an offensive force? There is a Security Council resolution. He will take care of that. It is an Arab problem, 
It should be sold by the Arab. Perhaps it was authorized, Mr. Ambassador, by the same people who invited you into Kuwait. Is there anything okay, now, that is negotiable? Now, either we should implement all Security Council <coughs> resolution even-handedly without having double standard. And that's, we are ready, this was an opening, we are ready to talk about it. You are bringing in... Well, uh, are they people, are they people yes, under but, occupation, uh, are they people being, being victim of atrocities, this Israeli atrocities? Uh, Why? Sir, this has been something that's been that? going on, yes, this has been something well, that has been going on for many years, that everybody then, is trying to negotiate, just a moment, please, uh, please let me finish. You don't say anything we do, unless you solve all the problems of the Middle East, we're going to stay in Kuwait. Right now, there is a, one major problem, and that's that you're in Kuwait. You're asking them to solve the major problems of the Middle East just like that, otherwise you won't get out. Now, you know that that's not possible. Realistically, as a diplomat, as an, as an intelligent man, you know that it isn't possible to do it like that. Why is it not possible? Because either you recognize the authority of the United Nations Security Council or not. Are we also going to link it to a solution of problems in Liberia and in Cambodia and everywhere else in the world where there we are talk, problems? It no, seems no, to I me said, that they, it seems it to me the if, if, if I, I might just finish, the region. I understand because that happens to suit your particular purpose and I understand why uh, your president made that proposal. But the fact of the matter is that most of the world right now is focused on the aggression of Iraq against Kuwait. As ABC's Sam Donaldson reports, tensions and troop strength is escalating on both sides of the Saudi border. Secretary Cheney arrived in northern Saudi Arabia today, the exact spot cannot be disclosed, in order to check on the progress of the U.S. buildup, which on the way over, he suggested, was already large enough to make Saddam Hussein think twice about crossing the Saudi border. As of today, I think we've got a lot of force in the theater, in the region, and uh, I think uh, if he were unwise enough to attack, um, he would pay a very heavy price. Since Wednesday, a Marine Rapid Deployment Force has been coming ashore on the Saudi-Persian Gulf Coast. The heavy equipment, long ago positioned aboard transport ships, and the fighting personnel of the 7th Marine Brigade flown in from Camp Pendleton, some 16,000 strong, join here to deploy on a defensive mission. But the Navy Admiral in charge of delivering this force made plain that these Marines have everything it takes to go on the offense if President Bush should give that order. We certainly have assault capability. What their mission will be, of course, would be directed from above. But this, again, this is a mechanized capability with tanks, armored vehicles, light armored vehicles. They have that mobility and they have that firepower to go anywhere they're told to go. Iraq now proposes that all foreign forces quickly withdraw from the region. UN troops serve as a buffer between Iraq and Saudi Arabia. The US end the naval blockade of Iraqi ships, and the foreigners in Iraq and Kuwait are then free to leave. We've been reluctant to use the term hostage, but when Saddam Hussein specifically offers to trade the freedom of those citizens of many nations he holds against their will in return for concessions, there can be little doubt that whatever these innocent people are called, they are in fact hostages. And I, and I want there to be no misunderstanding. I will hold the government of Iraq responsible for the safety and well-being of American citizens held against their will. The Americans here are here as a result of a real aggression against the Arab nation and Iraq. This aggression is being perpetrated by President Bush himself. We are activating those special categories of reservists that are essential to completing our mission. Uh, the United States considers its reserve forces to be an integral part of the total military command. Once notified, reservists could have as little as 24 hours to report for duty. Selected units will be called up as they are needed and when they are needed. So you will not see a, a sudden rush. Here we go again. Existing law permits the Defense Secretary to activate up to 200,000 reserve and National Guard troops for up to 180 days. Beyond that, the President could expand the call up by seeking additional authority from Congress or declaring a state of national emergency. While the initial numbers will be modest, officials here say that even the first call-up 
will touch National Guard units in all 50 states. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We begin tonight with Saddam Hussein, who wished to be portrayed today as the affectionate Iraqi protector of small British children. In a scene unlike anything we have seen since this crisis began, Saddam Hussein took along an Iraqi television crew to visit a group of British citizens who he will not allow to leave the country. Your presence here and in other places is meant to prevent the scourge of war. But we, for our part, we shall try to uh, treat you in the same way as we treat Iraqis, the, the people of Iraq. Because you are not hostages here. It was, to say the least, bizarre. The Iraqi leader told them it would be an experience for their diaries, from the ordinary to the truly ominous. Are you getting your milk, Stuart? And with cornflakes, too. Oh, that's good. All Iraqi children, Hussein said, cannot get cornflakes. Can we have, uh, you could have, in, in, in addition to the letters, uh, and be perhaps livelier to have uh, on the camera, on camera, pics, messages sent to your families. And so they made the first hostage photograph of its kind. In the Gulf crisis, officially, the Egyptians have been among the strongest Arab voices opposed to Hussein. And perhaps two million Egyptians are finding they are paying a personal price as a result. They are those Egyptians who've been working in Kuwait and Iraq. As a result of the crisis, they are leaving their jobs and trying to get home to Egypt. These are the lucky ones, the ones who made it across the border to safety in Jordan, running ahead of the rumors of war. They came with what they could carry. Many said Iraqi border guards took away even that. So many have arrived, 42,000 today alone, that Jordan has now closed the border indefinitely. Earlier today, King Hussein hinted the move was coming. We are doing all we can, but we may have to slow down the process of receiving more people unless we are able to speed up the movement of people from Jordan. Most of the refugees are Egyptian guest workers, released by Saddam because they are Arabs. Many have struggled onto ships that will take them home. 67,000 are still here, relying on the mercy of a poverty-stricken nation. The scene is one of complete chaos, effectively. There are some 12,000 people crammed into a space that is intended for 3,000. They are very frustrated. They have no money. They have enough food, but barely enough. The refugees are not Jordan's only money drain these days. Iraq is its biggest trading partner, receiving 70% of its exports. If King Hussein abides by the UN-decreed economic boycott... In human terms, it means that the Jordan economy will, will, will collapse. And so Jordan continues to process Iraqi oil, continues to truck goods there, continues to trade, and Hussein waffles on how he'll live up to the UN decree. There are rumors that Iraqi soldiers might go in and remove the diplomats from their embassies by force. Will they do that? Will they hang on to occupied Kuwait over the opposition of most of the world? If so, will there be a war? Whoever collides with Iraq will find in front of him columns of dead bodies which may have a beginning but may not have an end. Kuwaitis and Iraqis have been warned that if they are caught hiding Westerners, they will be hanged. Saddam did say he is willing to talk with any mediator, Kurt Waldheim, for example, the first Western leader Saddam has met this month. Waldheim has been criticized in Europe for dignifying Saddam with a visit, but he was rewarded with the release of about 100 Austrian citizens, up to now among Saddam's hostages. They arrived here in Amman tonight, along with the Austrian president. The Bush administration is jubilant tonight over this morning's historic U.N. Security Council vote allowing Western navies to use military might to enforce the economic embargo against Iraq. It is only the third time the United Nations has ever backed the use of force to impose its will, and the vote at 4 a.m. this morning was overwhelming. Thirteen votes in favor, 
No votes against, two abstentions. Even the Soviets abandoned their longtime client Iraq and voted to put teeth into the UN embargo. Only Cuba and Yemen abstained. The Iraqi ambassador was furious. I believe it's going to be used by certain member countries not to serve peace, but to achieve their own purpose of aggression. This is not an act of warfare. It's an act of enforcing the sanctions that uh, the United Nations put in two weeks ago and which are being flagrantly disobeyed by Iraq. Soaring oil prices this week sent stock markets around the world tumbling. A response to the growing conviction the crisis will end in a shooting war. Mr. Hussein, the solution to the crisis is very simple. Leave Kuwait. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Colin Powell, this week outlining U.S. goals. But just restoring Kuwait won't bring peace to the Gulf. That will probably require cutting Saddam Hussein down to size, if not toppling him. With the call-up of military reservists now, and all the talk of hostages too, this was not a week in which the prospects for a negotiated settlement looked particularly good. The build-up that will provide the U.S. with a clear military option continues. Within the next few days, the first M1 tanks and other heavy equipment for the 24th Mechanized Infantry Division arrive in Saudi Arabia. And a Marine Expeditionary Brigade now making its way across the Atlantic with 13 amphibious ships is expected to move into the Persian Gulf not far from the Kuwaiti coast. Once these units are in place, military strategists say the U.S. will have the means to quickly envelop Iraqi forces now occupying Kuwait. But for the moment at least, the word is a united international front and an embargo, not an invasion, to get the Iraqis out. Good evening. We begin the fourth week of the Gulf crisis. Today, the U.S. said that this continuing ill treatment of American diplomats in Kuwait and Iraq would no longer go unanswered. And so two-thirds of all the Iraqi diplomats in Washington are being expelled. The number of authorized Iraqi personnel at Iraq's embassy in Washington will be reduced from the current 55 to 19. They have 72 hours to get out of the country. Those Iraqi diplomats remaining are barred from traveling more than 25 miles from Washington. If they leave the country, they must reapply for a visa to get back in. We consider uh, this decision is uncalled for, unfair, and unjust. Seven more American civilians have been rounded up in Kuwait. Two were caught when they made the mistake of answering a knock on the door of their apartment. It was Iraqi soldiers. That brings to 63 the number of American civilians now in custody in both Kuwait and Iraq. Some official Americans did manage to get out of Iraq today. Early this morning, 52 diplomatic dependents, including 10 children under the age of three, were finally allowed to pass through a border crossing into Turkey. Three people were pulled out of that group and not allowed to leave. They are the college-age sons of diplomats who were visiting their parents before returning to school. There was another strange twist today. The Iraqis responded to the expulsion of some of their diplomats in Washington by threatening to throw out some American diplomats in Baghdad and Kuwait. For days, Iraq has prevented American diplomats from leaving, so this is one threat U.S. officials hope Iraq will carry out. The M1 tanks arrived in Saudi Arabia by ship today after two weeks at sea, along with Bradley troop carriers and heavy artillery. Pentagon sources say that 300 to 500 M1s will be sent to the area in the next few weeks. I feel really sorry for them Iraqis if it comes down to it, because we got them outgunned 40 miles an hour across country. They don't stand a chance. Experts agree the M1 can defeat the best Soviet-made Iraqi tanks. Its laser-guided weapons are far more accurate. Its 120-millimeter cannon can pierce Iraqi armor, and it can fight well at night. The heavy armor, combined with other forces now heading to the region, also gives the U.S. the capability to retake Kuwait by force. President Bush made it plain today he will not be deterred from taking military action, if it comes to that, by the presence of American hostages in Iraq. I feel very concerned about Americans that are held against their will, but we cannot permit hostage-taking uh, to shape the foreign policy of this country, and I won't permit it to do that. It was probably intended to be good public relations, the first chance for the American press to talk to the women and children graced by Saddam Hussein's offer to let them be released. Instead, images of confused, trapped people, frightened children, a media free-for-all. I've been frightened. I thought one day we're going to die. The next, you know, I mean, what? 
it's a situation we've never come across before and I mean every moment we're here uh, it's frightening. They are hostages now, watched by the world, while Saddam's promise of freedom dangles tantalizingly in front of them. This crisis has been a long time building. It has been a month of trauma for the hundreds of foreign hostages in Iraq and Kuwait and their families back home. General Norman Schwarzkopf. Anything you all want to know? If I don't know the answer, I'll just make it up. <laughs> Today was his first chance to see, and more importantly, to be seen, to rally the troops against Saddam Hussein. Let's face it, if he dares, if he dares come across that border and come down here, I'm completely confident that we're going to kick his butt when he gets here. Ironically, just before Iraq invaded Kuwait, Schwarzkopf staged a training exercise based on a hypothetical crisis in the Middle East. Today, he told officers he knows exactly what to do, and they told him exactly what he wanted to hear. We've been trying to get everybody bedded down, and make sure everybody's got what they need to go to war. And... Schwarzkopf has been there before, in Grenada and in Vietnam, where he won two Purple Hearts. He remembers the humiliation of that war and tells his troops this time it's different. American troops are the best people in the whole world, and they deserve all the support they can get, and they got it this time. ABC's Morton Dean traveled with the Reverend Jackson to Kuwait City yesterday and became the first Western television journalist to return to that occupied area. Today, he was able to file this report on Jackson's mission, giving a taste of the gloom that now pervades Kuwait's capital. Kuwait City, what we were permitted to see of it, was quiet, spooky, few people, few cars. An abandoned city with roadblocks. We are on the rooftop of a hotel overlooking the American embassy. That's the American compound right there. The American flag is still flying. A short distance away is a burned out Kuwaiti tank. Here and there we can see Iraqi positions where cars are being stopped, roadblocks. The streets are virtually empty. We see a few cars, but only a few. In the hotel, an American is hiding out in room 306. She gets a message to Jackson, but the Iraqis say she can't leave. Jackson says he won't go without her. There's a standoff. Finally, she's free. Then we walk from the hotel, destination, the U.S. Embassy. Nobody has been allowed in or out of the embassy in weeks. I have the names. You've got them ready? Yeah. And the passports? Yeah, uh, yeah. Passport. Good. We have Leonard The names of nine Americans are and called out. Right, and child. And child. The U.S. ambassador appears. He hadn't been seen publicly in about a month. His look tells what it's been like in there. We're doing all right so far. So far, so good. Every day, one at a time. Any messages for back home? Anything you want to say? We're still here. The hostages leave the compound. It's emotional dynamite. They are happy, sad, relieved, scared. Is this all a big trick, one would ask? So much is being left behind. Hi, Dad. Hi, sweetheart. Thank you. You will, Sam. Thank you. Their hearts are certainly heavier than their luggage. We've got a long ways to go. We arrive back at the airport where 17 more Americans join us. Some are pregnant. One woman had been hospitalized, a broken hip, a car accident. The group swells to 26. There are so many stories to tell, especially about conditions at the embassy. What about water? How, how did, you, did you have drinking water? Uh, we did for a while, and then we started using what we could out of the swimming pool, but the uh, water is basically out. We tore down some furniture to cook the food, um, took a playground set apart to, to, to burn, to cook the food. It's the only way we had. And finally, the flight to freedom is underway. There we go. The Iraqi ship Zenubia, with its cargo of Sri Lankan tea, was in the Gulf of Oman when it was challenged by the U.S. destroyer Goldsboro. After ignoring orders to change course, 
the Iraqi ship was boarded by Navy and Coast Guard personnel who diverted it in the direction of Oman. The team boarded the Zenubia without meeting resistance and will stay aboard the ship until it reaches its new destination. The Secretary of State, James Baker, who has been out of the public eye for much of the last month, paid his first post-vacation visit to Capitol Hill today, and he made it clear that America's future in the Persian Gulf is still very uncertain. George. Secretary Baker came to this overwhelmingly supportive House committee and answered question after question about just how deep the U.S. has gotten itself into the Persian Gulf while Congress was off on vacation. Baker said to stop Saddam Hussein will require continued American leadership. But leadership sometimes does cost. Uh, it's going to run us uh, probably around $6 billion for the balance of 1990. Baker admitted that America's military umbrella now covers not only Saudi Arabia, but also all the small Gulf states that are threatened by Iraq. Could this go on for months or years? Where, where, does, this, where does this end? Now, I, I can't tell you how long uh, uh, we might be there. It will depend on a whole host of factors. Baker hinted that even if the Iraqi crisis were settled, American forces are likely to play a critical role in the Persian Gulf for the indefinite future. He raised the American role in defending Europe as an example. American troops have been stationed there for more than 40 years. The White House had more praise for the Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak, citing his leadership in the current crisis. The White House announced the U.S. will help him out financially. It will forgive $7 billion in debt that Egypt owes the U.S. for past purchases of military equipment if Congress goes along. In this current crisis, the Bush administration is more than satisfied with Egypt's participation, but over the long haul, this loyalty to the American interest may well have an additional price. There are going to be a lot of uh, bills presented by the regimes that have cooperated with us for very tangible, con concrete, and perhaps costly things that they want. Many Arabs will want the United States to put more pressure on Israel to allow independence for Palestinians. In Saudi Arabia today, the Secretary of State James Baker told American troops that unprovoked aggression cannot be allowed to pay. Earlier, Mr. Baker won pledges of financial support, at least $5 billion each from the leaders of Saudi Arabia and from the Kuwait government in exile. As of today, including those Arab nations which have sent troops, 26 nations are represented in the military task force. The largest European contingent is French, 9,000 troops and nine warships. But politically, the French are concerned about the future. President Mitterrand said today that France would not automatically support an American attack against Iraq. Mr. Speaker, The most committed ally so far is Great Britain. 2,000 troops, three Air Force squadrons, and four warships. The British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, said today she will send more. The nub of the debate is to secure the withdrawal of Iraq from Kuwait. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, such a man must be stopped, and we shall persevere until he is. As we come to the end of the fifth week of the Gulf crisis, the number of military personnel in Saudi Arabia has now reached 200,000, half of them American. This is a special report from ABC News. Here are the two men arriving at their news conference just a short, about an hour ago, at Finlandia Hall here in Helsinki, uh, where they talked extensively about the political pressures which needed to be brought to bear. Gorbachev saying that he hoped Saddam Hussein would be realistic. Mr. Bush saying um, they had not discussed a Soviet military role uh, at the moment in the Persian Gulf, that he, Mr. Bush, thought the security of Saudi Arabia uh, was pretty much up to speed. With your permission, Mr. President, I, I hope that we can achieve a peaceful solution. And uh, the way to do that is to have Iraq comply with the United Nations resolutions. And I think the part of our joint statement Two short lines said it most clearly. Nothing short of the complete implementation of United Nations Security Council resolutions is acceptable. 
once again I confirm that all our time was used insofar as concerns this conflict for a search for a peaceful political solution. It's clear that even though the Soviets have had a long military and political relationship with the Iraqis, they have chosen in this instance to stand with the United States. Conditions in Kuwait are terrible. We're very happy to be fortunate enough to get out of there, and we're concerned for everyone who's left behind. Were you, were you fearful for your own personal Absolutely. safety? Absolutely. I was going daily from house to house when I heard they were searching homes. My husband put me in a car, and we went from home to home to hide out. It was just terrifying. The men are very frightened. We picked up yesterday 150 men of various Western nationalities. The men are now afraid, afraid that since we're gone, they are really going to be used as, as shields. Free, but not yet fully free. Their husbands and sons and fathers are being left behind to become a part of Saddam Hussein's protective shield. You kill their loved ones, he says, if you bomb me. With that in mind, the 430 Westerners, including 165 Americans, left Iraq. There's been no official reaction as yet concerning the Bush-Gorbachev end of the summit. Last night, though, President Hussein had his say. He said Iraq will not budge from Kuwait, and that was that. Today, Hussein told those nations which have been hurt by the embargo of Iraqi oil, just send your tankers to pick up all the oil you want and you may have it free which immediately put the U.S. in the position of saying no, that would violate the international economic embargo. Iraq will not be permitted to annex Kuwait. And that's not a threat, not a boast, that's just the way it's going to be. Seated on the House floor with other members of the diplomatic corps as President Bush addressed Congress and the nation tonight, Iraq's ambassador to the United States. We will stand by our friends. One way or another, the leader of Iraq must learn this fundamental truth. President Bush tonight carefully repeated his description of Saddam Hussein as a ruthless dictator who cannot be allowed to enjoy the fruits of his aggression. With the world watching and listening for nuances to see if President Bush was any more inclined toward negotiation with the Iraqi government, he meticulously left no room for doubt. Saddam Hussein is literally trying to wipe a country off the face of the earth. We do not exaggerate, nor do we exaggerate when we say Saddam Hussein will fail. An Iraq permitted to swallow Kuwait would have the econ economic and military power, as well as the arrogance, to intimidate and coerce its neighbors, neighbors who control the lion's share of the world's remaining oil reserves. We cannot permit a resource so vital to be dominated by one so ruthless, and we won't. Ambassador, to the degree mm -hmm. that you can, and I understand that there are, there are limitations on this, but uh, when you report back to your government, not only your analysis of what the president said tonight, but I understand you were also moving around the halls of Congress today, uh, buttonholing congressmen and senators and talking to some of their aides, what, what is it you will report on the mood of this country? I am uh, not very happy, to put it this way, uh, because I don't see any sign for negotiation, despite the fact we are insisting upon it, despite the fact that you know very well, uh, uh, even in the summit uh, conference uh, between uh, President Bush and Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev called for political uh, solution and peaceful solution. And this is what we want. We want peace. Pentagon sources say that about 120,000 troops from Iraq's regular army are deployed in tiers north of the Saudi border, while at least 1,600 tanks, backed by 40,000 troops, face the coast to ward off a possible amphibious assault by U.S. Marines. In addition, a brigade of nearly 10,000 Iraqi naval infantry troops, similar to U.S. Marines, has taken up positions on the island of Bubiyan. Sources say that Iraq's best pilots, those trained by the French and flying French-built Mirage jets, have also been committed to the Kuwait area. 
Pentagon sources say that at least 70,000 of Iraq's best troops, the Republican Guard forces, backed by advanced Soviet-made tanks and artillery, have now been deployed south of Basra in order to counterattack any forces penetrating toward their border with Kuwait. Assessing the Iraqi forces, U.S. officials say they are well-trained and equipped to defend against the sort of frontal infantry assault Iraq faced in the war with Iran. Officials here say the U.S. could take control of the skies within hours and that the combination of mobility and firepower would be more than a match for Iraq. Three weeks after telling the world's diplomats to close their embassies there and move to Baghdad, Iraqi troops have treated three diplomatic compounds in Kuwait as if they had no diplomatic status. Iraqi troops entered the Canadian embassy and detained the Canadian consul, along with American, British, Irish, and Australian diplomats who were having a meeting there. They were all held for several hours and then released. Iraqi troops entered the Belgian embassy and ordered diplomats to evacuate. The diplomats went to the ambassador's residence and the troops went away. And in the most serious incident, Iraqi troops entered the residence of the French ambassador. As he left for Camp David this afternoon, the president paused to denounce Iraq's raid on the French well, diplomatic building in Kuwait City. He said he had telephoned French President Mitterrand in Prague. Uh, to consult with him on the outrageous Iraqi break-in of the French embassy residence in Kuwait. And told him that I would do uh, anything I could to support whatever he uh, decides to do. Mr. Bush didn't say what that meant. He did note, though, that the embassy raids came amid increasing support for the international effort against Iraq. He specifically thanked Japan for its promise of $4 billion and Britain for its decision today to send an armored brigade. The president also confirmed the naval incident today in which the U.S. frigate Bruton, joined by the Australian frigate Darwin, first fired warning shots, then boarded an Iraqi tanker which had refused orders to stop in the Gulf of Oman. The vessel was empty and was eventually allowed to proceed. Mr. Bush was asked if all this and his tough talk about Iraq's moves against Western embassies meant the U.S. is ready for an escalation. Well, when an escalation is required from me, Saddam Hussein will know it. The news since the Sunday morning papers. In New York, in the early hours of this morning, the United Nations Security Council voted unanimously to condemn Iraq's forced entry into the French and other diplomatic missions in Kuwait. Next, the Council will discuss other further sanctions against Iraq, possibly including an air blockade. For reasons unknown, Iraq suddenly opened the border between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and thousands of Kuwaitis poured out and into Saudi Arabia this morning. It is a sign of her desperation that this woman, sick as she is, today risked a five-hour drive through the desert to flee her home. Others who also fled told why. Iraqi soldiers kill many uh, Kuwaiti uh, people. I would say the situation is getting worse, and they are, uh, as they're getting more organized and getting to know the neighborhoods better, they're just uh, taking sterner and sterner measures. It has led to this new exodus. Word spread late yesterday, one Kuwaiti calling another with the news that the southern border with Saudi Arabia was open. They left right after nighttime curfew. What do you have with you now? Everything. Nothing. These new refugees also tell stories about the Iraqi army, evidently occupying their country with no food, no fuel, no water of its own. They take the cement, they take the wood, they take uh, uh, the, the, the food, they take the bread. Egypt announced it was sending 15,000 more troops to Saudi Arabia. General Michael J. Dugan, chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force, says in an interview in today's Washington Post that the only effective option the United States has in Iraq is air power, a massive bombing campaign centered on Baghdad and targeting President Saddam Hussein. Today, Cheney fired General Dugan, the Air Force chief of staff, because he talked too much about what the U.S. military planned to do and where it planned to do it. President Bush addressed the Iraqi people on Iraqi TV. We have no quarrel with the people of Iraq. Iraq airs the president's speech uninterrupted, then broadcasts a scathing 25-minute rebuttal. Who was President Bush trying to talk to? Almost from the day Iraq invaded Kuwait six weeks ago, the adversaries have been hurling electromagnetic waves at each other through the ionosphere. Words and images designed to create or to rebut different images of reality. And sometimes it seems you can't tell what the players are up to without a scorecard. 
For instance, when Iraq President Saddam Hussein appeared with terrified women and children, it was widely assumed that this was a clumsy campaign to humanize Hussein, the dictator as Captain Kangaroo. But even now, Iraq is still running interviews with other clearly terrified hostages as part of its guest news. And that suggests another message may be being offered. For the people in Britain and the rest of the world to not forget we're here. We identify with the hostages. In a sense, the hostages are part of us. They are our extensions. And by scaring the hostages, in a sense, Saddam Hussein is trying to scare us. That, in turn, may explain the blunt language used by President Bush last week to declare that he would not be caught in the hostage trap. Of course our hearts go out to the hostages and to their families, but our policy cannot change, and it will not change. America and the world will not be blackmailed by this ruthless policy. By most accounts, Bush's message to Congress and to the American people on his Gulf policy was one of the best crafted and best delivered of his presidency. And Yesterday, President Bush had a different message, one aimed toward Iraq, and it contained some very blunt language. Let me say clearly, there is no way Iraq can win. Ultimately, Iraq must withdraw from Kuwait. As an Iraqi spokesman was denouncing the Bush speech, which was broadcast uninterrupted but with no advance notice, thousands of Iraqis poured into the streets as part of the stage demonstration. Did the president make any points in Baghdad? ABC News correspondent John Donvan watched the speech in a Baghdad coffee house. When the speech came on, they stopped everything they were doing and watched with great interest. You could see people shaking their heads in disagreement and tisking and waving their hands at the screen. And afterwards, they, they made it clear that they thought that the president was playing a game with them and trying to drive a wedge between them and their leader. What I do think it will do is to send a word, very objectively, uh, to other Arab countries uh, that it isn't uh, Saddam Hussein and the rest of the Arab world against the United States, but it's something quite different. And if two Iraqi citizens heard that, it'd be worth the effort. Meanwhile, Iraq was sending other messages throughout the Gulf, trying to paint Americans as an alien occupying force. Pirated footage of some innocent entertainment was described as something like an X-rated floor show. Radio broadcasts have accused American troops of eating pork, drinking alcohol, frequenting prostitutes. Other allegations are more extreme. For instance, that Americans have dropped toxic nuclear waste in the region. This battle of the airwaves, of course, is not going to decide the outcome of a Persian Gulf War. Sound bites and photo opportunities won't count for very much if the bullets start flying. But the competition does illustrate one clear reality of the modern age. Propaganda wars, which were once fought out largely inside the borders of competing countries, are now fought on a terrain without boundaries. This time, quite literally, the whole world is watching. Reporting from Saudi Arabia, Forrest Sawyer. Good evening. For the first time, Iraqi President Saddam Hussein has threatened to fire the first shot in the Persian Gulf crisis, vowing in a statement broadcast today to attack Middle East oil fields and Israel saying he will never permit the people of Iraq to be strangled. The warning came from Iraq's Revolutionary Command Council, headed by Saddam Hussein. It suggests Iraq might retaliate against oil fields in Saudi Arabia if current sanctions against this country go any further. The council's statement, read by Saddam's spokesman on television, said the U.S. had gone too far by occupying Arab lands and by imposing an economic blockade. The blockade exceeds all humanitarian limits, the statement said. The U.S. should not indulge further and should abandon its idea of pushing things to a military confrontation. The United Nations sent Saddam Hussein not one, but two powerful messages today. The Security Council voted to impose the air embargo against Iraq, and as if to underscore the importance, it did so using a high-level cast of characters that rarely gathers here in this chamber. It was the foreign ministers, not the UN ambassadors of such powers as the US, China, Soviet Union, Britain, and France, who came to cast their country's votes. Iraq has been quarantined because its brutal actions have separated it from the community of nations. There simply cannot be business as usual. 
In fact, Mr. President, there can be no economic exchanges with Iraq at all. As if the air embargo were not enough, it was Soviet Foreign Minister Shevard Nazi who chaired the Security Council session, representing the country that was once Iraq's main supplier of weapons. Earlier, before the General Assembly, Shevard Nazi called Iraq's invasion of Kuwait an act of terrorism against the world. He pleaded with Iraq as an old friend to listen to reason and then delivered a warning that even the Soviets, under the right conditions, might support use of force against Iraq. He later clarified. If there is a need to use force, it should be done by the United Nations, by the Security Council, and on a collective basis. This was the day that Saddam Hussein's videotaped message to the American people, the one in response to George Bush's on Iraqi television, arrived in Washington, delivered to the State Department by the Iraqi ambassador, and within hours made available to the television networks. Bush wants to bring back the sorrows of America and humanity by repeating the Vietnam experience, only this time in a more radical manner and more violent and more casual. There were signals from the White House today that it wants the international community to get even tougher on Saddam Hussein. And it comes on the day that the leader of the country, Iraq, invaded visited the man who most publicly has come to his defense. The White House did everything it could today to treat the Emir of Kuwait as the reigning leader of an independent country. The president himself even took his guest outside to see and wave to pro-Kuwaiti demonstrators just outside the White House gates. In the Oval Office, the Emir dutifully endorsed the administration's effort to get Iraq out of Kuwait by UN-backed sanctions. Everyone wants to prevent war and reach a peaceful solution, if, if possible, in accordance with Security Council's resolutions. But what emerged from the exiled rulers' meetings with Mr. Bush were deepening doubts about how much is left of the Emir's country, and an apparently increased willingness to consider force to end the Iraqi occupation. The Emir reportedly gave the President a shocking account of Iraqi atrocities, which Mr. Bush mentioned in his farewell statement later. Iraqi aggression has ransacked and pillaged a once peaceful and secure country. Its population assaulted, incarcerated, intimidated, and even murdered. It was clear afterward that Mr. Bush and his aides think the deteriorating situation in Kuwait has added new urgency to the crisis. National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft told reporters it is now conceivable the U.S. would ask the United Nations to back military action against Iraq. In Baghdad tonight, celebrations to honor the birth date of the Prophet Muhammad, an important religious occasion and an occasion for more political messages. On government television, President Saddam Hussein is shown meeting with an influential religious leader to discuss the crisis now facing not just Iraq, but the Arab world. An address from the president is read by his now familiar spokesman. He calls for an early dialogue on the Gulf crisis, but once again links it to a comprehensive peace settlement in the Middle East, which means, of course, the U.S. out of Saudi Arabia and Israel out of the occupied West Bank. So as the crisis in the Gulf ends its second month, Saddam Hussein is still playing for time, trying to weaken the solidarity of his enemies, trying to convince a hostile world that Iraqis are determined to hold on for years if necessary. This is an ABC News special report. President Bush at the United Nations. The United Nations Security Council's resolute response to Iraq's unprovoked aggression has been without precedent. Since the invasion on August 2nd, the Council has passed eight major resolutions setting the terms for a solution to the crisis. The Iraqi regime has yet to face the facts. But as I said last month, the annexation of Kuwait will not be permitted to stand. Go, go, go! Squads from the 101st Airborne trained today for house-to-house -house combat in an abandoned Talibag. desert village. No. Talibag, this room is clear. This is designed to simulate uh, any urban environment anywhere in the world. Uh, 
The Army described the exercise as routine training, but some soldiers also saw it as a signal to Saddam Hussein. So we were like to, to scare Saddam Hussein into to backing off, I guess. At the same time, more than 10,000 Marines have been practicing storming a beach from amphibious ships in the North Arabian Sea. A Navy source said the week-long exercise involving 18 ships and more than 90 aircraft is intended to simulate an assault on Kuwait. And the aircraft carrier Independence prepares to enter the Persian Gulf this week, where its 70 combat aircraft will be able to reach Iraq and Kuwait without refueling. The signal that we're on an offensive uh, mission has been given by the buildup of forces there that's been going on far above the level required for defense. It was classic Saddam Hussein, man of the people, brother in arms, the commander-in-chief on the front line in Kuwait, or Province 19, as the Iraqis now call it, visiting his troops, playing to the cameras for a television audience back home. He jumped into a foxhole and gave a trooper a little advice on how to position his machine gun. He chatted with a group digging foxholes along the beach and urged them to keep their spirits up. Bush is challenging us, he said. What can we do? We're not afraid of anything, they replied. We'll challenge Bush back and defend our homeland. His soldiers and his loyal commanders, thanking Saddam Hussein for giving them the honor of conquering Kuwait. In Israel today, the government began distributing gas masks in three small towns in the northern, southern, and central areas of the country. The campaign is in response to heightened tensions in the Persian Gulf crisis and repeated threats from Iraq that it will attack Israel with chemical weapons. In fact, Israelis of all ages are getting their masks. The protective kits include a syringe with nerve gas antidote and decontamination powder. There is also a special plastic chamber for those too young to comprehend chemical war. Most people seem to take this development in stride. But it is unsettling when gas masks go into your home. I'm hoping we remember everything and uh, that we can just live through it in a calm and quiet way. While gas masks might come in handy for Palestinians in the occupied territories, right now there aren't any for them. Israel says it will sell imported masks in the West Bank and Gaza if a real emergency arises. But for now, Israel is taking care of Israelis. At least 19 Palestinians dead in the bloodiest street clashes since Israel captured the occupied territory. The stones fell on Jews who were making no claim on Muslim shrines, but simply praying peacefully at the Western Wall. Israeli police saw it as an unprovoked attack against people celebrating a religious holy day, the Jewish Feast of the Tabernacle. There is no dispute that the police moved into the Muslim compound with considerable force. The Israelis say their officers had no choice but to shoot, that their lives were endangered by an angry mob. Palestinians say the shooting was indiscriminate, that demonstrators were fired upon as they fled. Palestinians agree they threw stones, but threw them because they suspected this Jewish fundamentalist group was approaching to lay claim to the Muslim compound that lies next to the Western Wall. <laughs> to Jews, it is the Temple Mount, because it was once the site of their two biblical temples. The Western Wall is all that remains of the ancient structures. <laughs> to Muslims, it is the Noble Sanctuary, containing both the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Golden Dome of the Rock, the place where it is written that the Prophet Muhammad ascended into heaven on a white horse. 35 acres, yet much of the Middle East hatred and mistrust can be traced to this spot. And it was that hatred and mistrust that produced the bloodiest single day for Palestinians since Israel captured the old city from Jordan 23 years ago. Palestinians and the PLO have backed Saddam Hussein ever since the Gulf crisis erupted, seeing him as the only Arab capable of standing up to Israel and the U.S. The American and foreign military buildup in the region did not help but to increase the tension and complicate the situation. The killings in Jerusalem strain an already strained U.S.-Israeli relationship. 
There seems to be less sympathy for Israel in the Bush cabinet, especially for Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir's right-wing government, and especially now that the Soviet Union is no longer a Mideast player. The U.S. late Friday voted with the U.N. Security Council to condemn Israel. The draft resolution has been adopted unanimously. The first time the U.S. has censured its longtime Middle East ally since 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon. This is an incident which never should have happened. The shooting of Palestinians in Jerusalem provoked a firestorm of criticism. Israeli security forces uh, need to be better prepared for such situations, uh, need to act with greater restraint. The shootings threatened to unravel the Gulf coalition the administration had so carefully strung together to isolate Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein. The shootings on Jerusalem's Temple Mount severely embarrassed moderate Arabs in the U.S.-led Gulf Alliance who are already under pressure to change their allegiance. And the U.S.'s moderate Arab allies are taking the heat. We are disappointed that the Israeli government has decided not to cooperate with the mission. In fact, we think that a failure to cooperate denies Israel an opportunity to present its case to the Secretary General. In a private message over the weekend, Secretary Baker used far tougher words to urge Israeli Foreign Minister David Levy to receive the UN delegation. Baker told Levy that by not being prepared for Palestinian demonstrators, quote, Israel played into the hands of Saddam Hussein, thus drawing public attention away from Iraq. I wish to emphasize, Baker told Levy, that if you reject the Security Council's resolution, some will unfairly compare you to Saddam Hussein and his rejection of Security Council resolutions. To deal with the crisis in the Persian Gulf, President Bush has reached out to the Arab world as never before. This is shaking the relationship between the U.S. and Israel, as the two countries now see their best interests on some issues in sharply different terms. The Iraqi invasion and occupation of Kuwait that began on August 2nd is now revealed as a story of ruthless repression and barbaric behavior. It is a story of murder, rape, looting, torture and terror. It is told by some of the Kuwaitis who have escaped. And uh, the bruises all, all around the body, from the be they have been beaten and uh, sometimes uh, the face, the, the, uh, the ears, uh, are removed. His beard was stripped off, his nails was taken off, and all his body was, a lot of bands inside his body, even his genitalia, everything. We couldn't recognize him. President Bush has finally compared Saddam Hussein to Adolf Hitler. In Texas, Mr. Bush was recounting Kuwaiti reports of two young men allegedly executed by Iraqi soldiers as their parents were forced to watch. The president warned that atrocities, Iraqi atrocities, could lead to trials similar to the Nuremberg War Crimes trials after World War II. The Pentagon said today that the Army will send several hundred more of its most modern M1A1 tanks from Germany to Saudi Arabia, more than doubling the number available for Operation Desert Shield. When the troops are now, no U.S. war for oil company profit. The peace movement is once again organizing and mobilizing, signing up activists like Paul Dotson, a graduate student at Virginia Tech. Dotson is in the Marine Reserves, but now wants out. I'm not going to die and I'm not going to kill anybody just because people in America think that they should be able to drive for $1.25 a gallon. No for war, yes for peace, U.S. sovereignty. Unlike the 60s, the peace movement of the 90s is made up of different groups with different objectives. Environmentalists want the U.S. out of the Middle East because they want the U.S. less dependent on oil. Social activists want the troops home to free up more money for the homeless and unemployed. Some veterans groups want to avoid further bloodshed in foreign wars and have bought television airtime. We don't want another Vietnam. How many more body bags and graveyards and monuments? How many more Americans coming home in wheelchairs, like me, will it take before we learn? Coalition, can I help you? In most major cities, Americans have volunteered to organize rallies and spread the word. So far, their numbers have been small, but not their enthusiasm. What do we want? Peace! When do we want it? Now! Peace activists say that if they learned anything from the Vietnam experience, it's the need to demonstrate loudly and quickly. To protest now, before shots are fired. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Colin Powell, reviewed the troops in Saudi Arabia today. He 
He said Iraqi forces remain solidly entrenched in Kuwait and show no signs of pulling back. For Saudi Arabia, the confrontation has had an embarrassing side effect. They are making enormous amounts of money because they are pumping out an enormous amount of oil at very high prices. Saudi Arabia has reached its capacity, pumping nearly 8 million barrels of oil a day, about 3 million more than when the Gulf conflict began. At today's prices, that means the kingdom is earning an extra $80 million a day. Definitely, we're, we're making a lot of money, but uh, we're spending it at the same time. In fact, little of it has been spent so far, but Saudi Arabia has promised to pay $12 billion a year for U.S. and other combat forces here, as well as for aid to such allies as Egypt and Turkey. Another $4 billion is committed to Kuwaiti refugees. Even so, the first thing the Saudis have done is to eliminate their own budget deficit. Iraq's apparent commitment to dig in and defend its conquest of Kuwait has, according to Defense Secretary Cheney, led the U.S. to continue its own military buildup. We've not yet settled on an upper limit in terms of our total deployment. For, so for a number of reasons, I would expect there will be a continuing flow of uh, forces to the Gulf in the uh, period immediately ahead. This continuing buildup will expand the capability of U.S. forces to go on the offensive. And that capability will be increased further by the replacement or rotation of U.S. troops already in the Gulf. For example, officials expect the lightly armed 12,000-manned 82nd Airborne Division to be home for Christmas. It is likely to be replaced by a 15,000-man armored or mechanized infantry division from the U.S. or Germany. In addition, units going home will not leave until their replacements have acclimated themselves to the area. That overlap could mean that next February or March, when the rotation is in full swing, U.S. troop strength in the Gulf could temporarily increase by up to 50 percent. And here's an irony. At a time when the U.S. is prepared to spend perhaps billions of dollars more to send even more troops to Saudi Arabia, the government is also obliged to spend $2 billion to feed the Iraqi army. That's right, the army which the U.S. may have to fight. The Iraqis are eating American wheat, corn, and rice that the U.S. Department of Agriculture sold to Iraq before the invasion of Kuwait. Half of all imported Iraqi grain came from the U.S. What is worse, it turns out the grain will, in effect, be free, a gift from American taxpayers. To enable Iraq and other nations to buy American surplus grain, the United States had offered to guarantee loans from American banks. By last year, Iraq was the biggest single customer for these special loans, allowing Saddam Hussein to buy food on credit while using his cash to buy weapons. Iraq has now defaulted on all these loans, leaving the U.S. government to pay the bills. Last week, the Department of Agriculture, the USDA, was obliged to begin writing multi-million dollar checks to the banks that made those loans. Government officials estimate that it could cost the U.S. about $2 billion to cover all the Iraqi loans. And there's more evidence today of how Iraq is preparing for war if the battlefield is Kuwait. Actually, not today precisely. We've purchased an amateur video shot two weeks ago in Kuwait. And ABC's David Ensor has been showing it to military analysts in Washington today. The videotape shows heavy Iraqi military equipment heading out of Kuwait City, south, towards the border with Saudi Arabia. Dozens of Soviet-made T-72 tanks and armored personnel carriers. Overhead, a French-made troop transport helicopter. The big self-propelled artillery vehicles. One area, says defense analyst Tony Cordesman, where the Iraqis may have an edge. It's a French design with very long range, excellent barrel life, and a very, very rapid rate of fire. Actually, better than any of the artillery weapons we have in the area in terms of rates of fire and range per round. Shots taken by night at Kuwait International Airport show it bristles with Soviet-made surface-to-air missiles intended to shoot down attacking planes. The U.S. already knew Iraq had all the weapons shown on the tape, but the fact that so many of them have been moved south is evidence that driving Iraq out of Kuwait would be more difficult than many had thought. I'm prepared at this juncture to, to wait to see if uh, economic sanctions will work at this juncture. But again today, the president talked of the danger to American hostages. 
a subject well, the administration know, used to play down, but which could provide a legal basis for U.S. military action with or without advance U.N. or congressional approval. I am concerned about the lives of Americans held against their will. So are the American people. He also spoke of the besieged U.S. Embassy in Kuwait in words that seemed aimed directly at the patriotic sentiment of the U.S. public, whose support would be vital if war came. The American flag is flying over the Kuwaiti embassy, and our people inside are being starved by a brutal dictator. And do you think I'm concerned about it? You're darn right I am. And what I'm going to do about it, let's just wait and see. Because I have had it with that kind of treatment of Americans. And for the first time, the president came close to saying that the sanctions, which have been the core of his policy, are not working. I wouldn't say that they had not been successful at all, but they certainly haven't driven the man to do what he should have done, which is to get out of, uh, get of, out of Kuwait and, and uh, reverse this aggression. In Iraq today, as always, it was harder to get inside Saddam Hussein's mind. From the Iraqis today, an offer to the families of foreign citizens being held against their will, come to Iraq and visit them during the Christmas and New Year's holidays. The idea that this is somehow supposed to be in the Christmas spirit of having people come visit family members who are being held as hostages at strategic sites is it, just really a very sick notion. Spokesperson Margaret Tutwiler said the U.S. would not prevent family members from going, but warned it could be very risky, and the family members themselves might become hostages. Frustration for the families is rising as they hear new details of what being a hostage is like. Recently released French hostages carried letters from several Americans describing what they called the Iraqi gulag, bars on the windows, locks on the door, and armed guards at night. One wrote, quote, I have been moved five times, not heard from anyone since August 16th. Tell my wife I love her. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Sitting in tonight, Diane Sawyer. Good evening. President Bush tried to send Saddam Hussein this message today. Come to your senses. To make sure the message gets through, Mr. Bush will send at least 100,000 more troops to the Persian Gulf, and hundreds of tanks and planes, and three more aircraft carriers. And for the first time, he said those troops will give the U.S.-led coalition the ability to attack, not just to defend. It is a major change. I have de today directed the Secretary of Defense to increase the size of U.S. forces committed to Desert Shield to ensure that the coalition has an adequate offensive military option should that be necessary to achieve our common goals. The main goal is to get Saddam to withdraw from Kuwait, something that economic sanctions and an international force of 300,000 troops has failed to do. The president made it clear that by sending new military might, he is sending Saddam a message. I would think that uh, when he surveys the force that's there, uh, this a force that's going, what other countries are doing in this regard, uh, he will recognize that he is up against a, uh, a just an un a foe that he can't possibly uh, manage militarily. American soldiers heading for the Gulf, and shortly there will be more, lots more, as the crisis this week entered a new phase and the administration openly began preparing for war against Saddam Hussein. I have de today directed the Secretary of Defense to send significant additional U.S. military forces uh, to Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf. Significant they are. Half the U.S. armored divisions in Europe, giving U.S. forces the edge in modern battle tanks. Three more aircraft carriers for a total of six, nearly half the carriers in the U.S. Navy. A second battleship, the Missouri, with its 16-inch guns and cruise missiles and another entire marine expeditionary force. In all, about 200,000 troops are being added to the roughly 250,000 already in place, almost as many as were deployed at the height of the Vietnam War. And sufficient, it's thought, to punch through the estimated 430,000 strong Iraqi army that's dug in behind fortifications along the Kuwaiti border. For months now, the official line has been that U.S. troops were defending Saudi Arabia. The new buildup has a different rationale. 
a switch from the defense to the offense. The necessary diplomatic accompaniment to this week's change of direction was provided by Secretary of State James Baker, who last night returned from a week-long tour of Europe and the Middle East, preparing the Allies for war. There is an extraordinary degree of unanimity uh, and, and support uh, for, the, for the path that we're on, and I'm very pleased with that. Baker was seeking support for a UN resolution permitting the use of force to dislodge Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. Although he was told that sanctions need more time to work, none of America's partners said they'd stand in the way of such a UN resolution. Not Egyptian President Mubarak, not even China's foreign minister. And the Soviets shifted their position as well. After talks with Baker, Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze said force could not be ruled out. And the strongest support of all came from Britain's Margaret Thatcher, who leveled her own threat at Saddam Hussein. Either he gets out of Kuwait soon, or we and our allies will remove him by force, and he will go down to defeat with all its consequences. The Iraqi dictator, meanwhile, continued his efforts to undermine the alliance, sending visiting former Japanese Premier Nakasone home with a plane load of hostages, and former West German Chancellor Willy Brandt got similar consideration. It was a reminder that the alliance won't hold together forever. Significantly, the administration Friday announced it will no longer be rotating troops out of the Gulf, indicating it may force an early end to the crisis. When? Well, the reinforcements won't be in place till January, and by April the weather makes desert warfare difficult. Strong indications of when the U.S. would attack. Unless, of course, Saddam Hussein blinks. But many now fear he won't, and there's mounting concern in Congress, which is in recess, that the president is bent on war. If that decision has been made inside the White House, uh, then I think the president uh, must bring the Congress back and seek support for that change in policy. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, reporting tonight from Jordan. Good evening. Earlier today in Baghdad, the Iraqi president told us that every critical issue in the Middle East was negotiable. And he did not rule out negotiating an end to the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait the man who conquered Kuwait and who has said in the past that any army trying to dislodge him would be burned by the blood of Iraqi martyrs, said today he did not want war. In fact, he said it over and over again. He admitted his only justification for holding Americans hostage was to protect himself against American attack. We reminded President Hussein today that this was an issue on which all Americans were united. They were angry. <laughs> Not only the Americans are angry about this fact, I myself am angry because of it, this situation. Our only, excuse, our, our only justification for this situation is that the presence of these people may uh, help retract anybody who may opt for war, it may make or put them in for hesitate a little before jumping into a decision of this nature. Any dialogue between you and the United States now? Our ambassador was told that dialogue was being conducted through the, the ambassadors in both capitals. But of course, the way we see it is that dialogue of this nature is simply communications, uh, com com communicating positions on either party. Mr. Bush, Mr. President, has said repeatedly that he will be ready when you unilaterally withdraw from Kuwait. This is not dialogue. These are preconditions of, for capitulation. Uh, on what basis, uh, what, uh, what kind of dialogue is this? On what basis is there going to be dialogue between us? As you say when you do that the United States is imposing preconditions, does that mean that your present position in Kuwait is negotiable? When I say something, I mean it. Saddam Hussein said time and again, as did everyone else, if only the United States will talk. So on the one hand, he may be making a genuine plea for a political compromise. On the other hand, he may well be using a television interview to play for time talking about negotiations in the hope of sowing dissent among those nations currently threatening his regime militarily. 
because he will not leave Kuwait voluntarily. So often in the Middle East, the bottom line, just like that line in the sand, keeps shifting. The president came to Saudi Arabia's eastern province to share Thanksgiving with the troops, to try to boost their morale, which is wearing thin, and to try to once again explain what many are questioning, why they are here. Making a stand in defense of peace and freedom. And we're here to protect freedom, here to protect the future, and here to protect innocent lives. For the first time, the president seemed to emphasize Iraq's efforts to acquire nuclear weapons. And every day that passes brings Saddam Hussein one step closer to realizing his goal of a nuclear weapons arsenal. And that's another reason, frankly, why more and more our mission is marked by a real sense of urgency. But the president refused to explain whether there was new information about Iraq's nuclear weapons program. And when pressed on the issue, sidestepped it and talked about chemical warfare. I would just stay with what I've said here today. And uh, I, when I said that he had never, that he's used every weapon he's had, I'm thinking primarily of the brutality of those chemical weapons that he did use on his own people. As he toured desert bunkers and posed for pictures, I know, you're gonna be in it. the president repeated a promise that he would not keep soldiers here a day longer than required. It's a scene that's occurred before in American diplomacy. In pursuit of a short-term goal, the United States strikes a deal with a dictator who shares its interests, ignoring his past and hoping he won't prove too embarrassing in the future. But Hafez al-Assad has already proved himself an uncomfortable ally. Two months after he joined forces with those opposed to the Iraqi takeover of Kuwait, his own troops attacked the last remaining resistance to the de facto Syrian control of Lebanon. Assad and Saddam Hussein are bitter rivals, a fact the U.S. would like to exploit. But in the way they dominate their neighbors, and in many other ways, they're very much alike. Both Arab nationalists ruling with an iron hand and not afraid of violating human rights. Both sponsor terrorists as well, making some wonder why America is now doing deals with Assad. For whatever price, Syria pledged 16,000 troops to the Gulf Alliance. Most of them have not yet arrived. Many observers doubt anyway that Syrian troops will be ordered into action if the Gulf crisis comes to a fight. War could finish off his rival at little cost to him. And what does the United States get from Syria? A token detachment of troops and an ally in the Arab camp, but not a fully committed one. Some see America's unlikely alliance with Hafez al-Assad as standard fare in the Middle East. But it's worth remembering that in the last Gulf crisis, Assad shared his interest with Iran and the U.S. backed Saddam Hussein. This is a special report from ABC News. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Jamison in New York, where the United Nations Security Council at this moment is voting on its most dramatic step yet against Saddam Hussein and Iraq, a resolution that would authorize the use of force if Iraq does not withdraw from Kuwait by the 15th of January. There was a sense of some urgency to the timing of this vote since Yemen, which has been sympathetic to Iraq, takes over the president's chair from the United States on Saturday. The result of the voting is as follows, 12 votes in favor, two votes against, one abstention. The draft resolution has been adopted as resolution 678-1990. Iraq's ambassador to the UN accused the Security Council of being a willing tool of the US he said Iraq wanted peace, but the U.S., because it refuses to negotiate, is trying to force a war. If war is imposed upon us by the United States, this will be our destiny. I wish to reaffirm to you that our people will not kneel. But member after member spoke in favor of the resolution, and when the vote came, Iraq was virtually alone. Though today's vote was an overwhelming success for the Bush administration, it had a price. 
For example, to bring China on board, Secretary Baker had to promise a Washington visit for the Chinese foreign minister and the prospect of better relations, even though China is again cracking down on dissidents. To win Soviet support, there were pledges to let Moscow know about U.S. military plans in the Gulf, no surprises, and an effort to get American friends like Saudi Arabia to help the Soviets with financial aid. And with Latin American and African foreign ministers, parts of the world Baker has been ignoring, there were promises that the U.S. would pay more attention and, if possible, provide more financial help. In trying to keep various Arab countries in the anti-Iraq camp, the Bush administration has paid a different kind of price. By snubbing Israel, the U.S. has allowed relations with that old friend to fall to a bitter low. I'm asking Secretary Jim Baker to go to Baghdad to see Saddam Hussein. President Bush tries to break the deadlock in the Persian Gulf. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. For the first time since Iraq invaded Kuwait on the 2nd of August, President Bush has talked about talking to Saddam Hussein. He got to understand what the alternatives are to complying with the United Nations resolution. The best way to get that across is one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Baker looking him right in the eye. I've been told that he, he doesn't necessarily believe that I am totally committed to what I've been saying. And here's a good opportunity to have him uh, understand that face to face. Late this afternoon, Iraq's ruling command council issued a statement saying Iraq would accept the offer to exchange visits and envoys. The official Iraqi spokesman appeared on the evening news with more government reaction. He quoted from the Quran, when your enemy seeks peace, you should seek peace too. But the Iraqis also insist that all Middle East issues, including the Palestinian question, be part of the discussions, continuing to try to wrap their invasion of Kuwait into the other problems of the region. Well, now that the Bush administration has won a United Nations endorsement to use force if necessary, and now that Iraq and the U.S. are going to sit down and talk about war or peace, the administration did think it was finally safe to answer some of Congress's questions in hearings on Capitol Hill. Economic sanctions, Baker said, may be having an impact on Iraq's economy, but have produced no apparent changes in Saddam Hussein's policy toward Kuwait. He shows no signs of complying with any of the Security Council resolutions. Instead, he appears to be doubling his bets. Waiting not only gives him time to break the sanctions, but waiting, Mr. Chairman, imposes costs on us. Waiting, he said, gives Saddam Hussein more time to fortify Kuwait, to build chemical and biological weapons, and to try to split the coalition that now opposes him. Baker said he will go to Baghdad to tell Saddam Hussein that unless he withdraws from Kuwait, he will face disaster. There will be no negotiations. Senator Dodd wondered why Baker ruled out negotiations. But Senator, you for surely you are not suggesting that we go over there and negotiate something short of the UN resolutions. Well, I wasn't I wasn't suggesting that, uh, but I'm also not suggesting that there may be something here. What which, is it? Well, I don't know. That's what I presume diplomacy is about. This is not a a, uh, a show and tell. It is a serious effort to try and find a peaceful resolution. Baker said no decision has yet been made on whether to use military force, but he gave a chilling description of how that option would be employed. Our aim is to ensure that if force must be used, it will be used suddenly, massively, and decisively. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Sitting in tonight, Diane Sawyer. Good evening. Words Americans have been hoping to hear. The hostages, Saddam Hussein's guests, may be coming home. There are more than 6,000 Western and Japanese citizens still detained or hiding in Iraq and Kuwait, 930 of them Americans. This morning, Hussein announced they will be free to leave, maybe within days. The Voice of America has already started telling them preparations are underway. I like that. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. No, I'm very, very happy. It's Overwhelming. The uh, taxi driver informed us. He said, oh, you're free. After four months and four days in captivity, hostages learned that President Saddam Hussein would release them all, both in Iraq and those hiding in Kuwait, unconditionally and immediately. Tonight, they came home, walking down the stairs and onto the tarmac. 
many shook hands. One man was carried down the stairs to a wheelchair. They are part of a flood of former hostages, thousands of North Americans, Europeans, and Asians released by decree of Iraq's parliament last week. Earlier, the flight out of Baghdad gave some their first chance to share experiences and express emotions. One American took out a flag. Others talked of fear and deprivation. One man said he lived in Kuwait for months in darkness with little food, losing 35 pounds. As they reached Frankfurt, they embraced friends and relatives and cheered. Two men praised President Bush. He got me out of here, okay? I'm alive, uh, no Americans died. He did a great job. When we launch it, we will launch it violently. We will launch it in a way that will make it decisive so that we can get it over as quickly as possible and there's no question who won when it's over so that we can then start the process of rebuilding Kuwait and sending our forces back home. And if U.S. forces attack, one soldier asked, how far will they go? The question is, are we just going to fight in Kuwait or are we going to uh, level Baghdad? No comment. What if Saddam Hussein withdraws from most, but not all, of Kuwait? Uh, the only acceptable outcome is for him to get completely and totally out of Kuwait. The tough talk generally played well, but some troops were still worried. I think all in all, the rest of us would like to uh, go home and say we deterred aggression instead of actually having to go into conflict. In the cradle of Islam, Christmas Eve is just another day unless you are an American soldier. Not far from Kuwait, the 1st Marine Division Band serenaded troops in the sand. Hopes of peace, fears of war, on a Christian holiday in a Muslim land far from home. It's kind of a, a, a mixed lonely feeling somewhat. Uh, we have the friendship of all the, the members in our battalion, but uh, we're here without our families. The military wants a low-key Christmas to avoid offending the Saudis. Religious services will be confined to bases. Christmas stockings are allowed, nativity scenes are not, but even a little holiday decorating helps. It's gonna be my first year away from home. I got this tree from my mom, she sent kind of make it feel at home. Gifts from home have piled up under tiny trees and thousands of tents. Got a bunch of Oreo cookies and assorted other cookies and a chocolate teddy bear. Here, as everywhere, there are those who cannot wait. I'm like a kid, I guess. I just opened it up early. They came and they were wrapped and no one was around to tell me not to. Many soldiers also found time to give, a Christmas custom that did not seem to offend Saudi merchants. Eight, nine. Okay, I got the nine. Holiday mail has been almost more than the military could handle, an average of two pounds per soldier per day. Some lucky ones got a perfumed reminder of home. And the Christmas card. On Christmas, most troops will get time to relax, a day off from practicing war. But they have been put on a heightened state of alert just in case. It's a season of peace and a season of love and giving, and you know we're over here, and quite possibly this could turn nasty. Um, in a short time. It is a difficult mission for American troops celebrating the season of peace in a theater of war. Senior administration officials have told ABC News that U.S. forces in the Persian Gulf are likely to adopt a far more aggressive posture if the January 15th deadline passes without agreement on an Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait. The purpose would be to persuade Saddam Hussein that he has gravely underestimated the risk of war. While officials declined to say precisely what steps will be taken, they confirmed that the options include moving U.S. ground forces in Saudi Arabia closer to the border with Iraq and Kuwait, holding exercises that simulate the start of a military offensive, moving aircraft carriers to the northern Persian Gulf within closer striking distance of Iraq and Kuwait, putting an 11,000-man Marine amphibious force into position 
to launch attacks by air and sea against the Kuwaiti coast. Beginning reconnaissance and other air missions over Kuwaiti territory, increasing night air operations to demonstrate to Iraq the inadequacy of their nighttime defenses, and ordering U.S. aircraft on patrol to lock their weapons radar on Iraqi warplanes as though ready to fire. For weeks now, there has been a deadlock over a date when Secretary of State Baker would go to Baghdad to see Saddam Hussein. The Iraqis insisted on January 12th. The administration said no. If the meeting wasn't held by today, a new offer would be placed on the table. A new offer was placed on the table. The president says that Secretary of State Baker will be available next Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday to talk in Switzerland with Iraqi Foreign Minister Tarek Aziz. The president told congressional leaders this morning that he was attempting to go the extra mile for peace by proposing the meeting next week in Geneva. But if Iraq says yes, it is not clear what Secretary Baker and Foreign Minister Tarek Aziz will have to talk about. So tough are U.S. conditions. This offer is being made subject to the same conditions as the president's previous attempt. No negotiations, no compromises, no attempts at face saving, and no rewards for aggression. U.S. officials say Baker would do little more than tell Aziz that the whole world demands Iraq withdraw. The secretary will carry a letter from President Bush to Saddam Hussein. Today, as Baker swore in the new U.S. ambassador to Kuwait, Edward Ganin, the secretary used some of his toughest language to date, saying the days of Iraq's occupation are numbered. And so, as January 15 approaches, we are closer and closer to restoring Kuwait's sovereignty whether by peace or whether by force. Analysts say the proposed meeting between Baker and Aziz was considered necessary to convince Congress, the public, and governments in Europe and the Middle East that the Bush administration is still interested in a peaceful settlement. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Sitting in tonight, Carol Simpson. Good evening. Saddam Hussein said yes today. Yes, his foreign minister, Tariq Aziz, will fly to Geneva to talk with Secretary of State Baker. It will happen next Wednesday, just six days before the U.N. deadline for Iraq to get out of Kuwait. Mr. Aziz said he was going out of respect for world opinion and criticized the U.S. for what he called bad tactics. The announcement came tonight on state-controlled Iraqi television. It was not a gracious acceptance. The American proposal for a meeting was described as arrogant. The official statement from Iraq's ruling Revolutionary Command Council said, in spite of the manner and way the proposal was made, because Iraq wants peace, Tariq Aziz will go to Geneva on January 9th to meet James Baker. It had taken the Iraqis more than 24 hours to respond. The morning newspapers carried no hint of any new prospect for talks between the two countries. But because many Iraqis listened to radio broadcasts from outside the country, they already knew Washington had made an offer. Them sitting down and talking about it will, will give a chance for peace. And that's all what we are for here. I mean, Muslims look for peace, Christians look for peace. This is a special report from ABC News. Good afternoon, I'm Peter Jennings. The United States and Iraq have ended an unusually lengthy day of talks on the crisis in the Persian Gulf. They have been talking to many people surprised for six and a half hours in the Geneva Hotel and within minutes we will learn from the Secretary of State Jim Baker and the Iraqi Foreign Minister Tariq Aziz in separate news conferences whether a political settlement of the Gulf crisis is possible or whether the U.S. and Iraq are looking more intently at the prospect of war. Regrettably, ladies and gentlemen, I heard nothing today that in over six hours, I heard nothing that suggested to me any Iraqi flexibility whatsoever on complying with the United Nations Security Council resolutions. We had grave or big differences about the issues we addressed. From the moment they sat down this morning, it was a grim and uncompromising conversation. Secretary Baker and Foreign Minister Aziz admitted there was no apparent progress toward a peaceful settlement and no new ideas were introduced by either side. Each man acknowledged that time is running out and the possibility of war appears to be growing. Iraq will be choosing a military confrontation which it cannot win 
and which will have devastating consequences. Iraq will defend itself in a very bold manner. We are a courageous nation. Aziz was asked if Iraq would attack Israel if a war starts. Yes, absolutely yes. Aziz claimed Iraq would not be the first to attack anybody. When presented with the letter from President Bush for Saddam Hussein, Aziz read it carefully, then refused to accept it, saying President Bush used inappropriate language for communicating with the Iraqi president. I've been around the diplomatic track for a long time. The letter was proper, it was direct, and it was what I think would have been helpful to him to show him the resolve of the rest of the world, certainly of the coalition. The president said he worries that Saddam doesn't recognize that the coalition will use its formidable force against him. And he held out only slim hope others, such as the UN Secretary General, can sway the Iraqi leader. I'd have to level with the American people. Nothing I saw today, nothing, uh, uh, leads me to believe that this man is going to be reasonable, that, uh, that he'll come around. But we ought to keep trying. We ought to keep trying right down to the wire. In Washington today, the Senate and the House of Representatives began debating one of the most fundamental responsibilities of Congress, the right to declare war. Sometimes it's hard to see history actually being made. Nevertheless, this was not just another day in Congress. So today, the Senate undertakes a solemn constitutional responsibility. Mitchell, the Democratic leader, introduced a resolution challenging the president's authority to order an attack on Iraq by himself and the wisdom of doing so now. The grave decision for war is being made prematurely. Wait, he in a parade of his fellow Democrats argued, Nunn, Leahy, Simon, Kennedy, Biden. What's the hurry for war? What's the hurry? But the Republican leader asked how long the country should wait. 30 days, 30 months, 30 years. And so I'm not certain what kind of a signal that sent, but it seemed to me it takes Saddam Hussein off the hook. What's required, Dole argued, and so did Republicans Danforth and D'Amato, is a clear message to Baghdad that America speaks with one clear voice. Today's most passionate voice had not been heard before in the Senate. Freshman Democrat Wellstone of Minnesota, his very first words on the Senate floor. The fathers and mothers of young men and women from Minnesota who were now in the Persian Gulf have not forgotten what war means in personal terms, and we must not forget either. This is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. The Congress debates, the Secretary threatens, and the public worries. So it is on the last weekend before the deadline by which Saddam Hussein is supposed to leave Kuwait. It is harder and harder to find people who believe that he will, voluntarily. There was certainly no mistaking the public change in the Secretary of State. The self-described somber negotiator of Geneva only two days ago was in the Middle East today, wielding a club. ABC's John McQuethy was with Mr. Baker in Saudi Arabia. In language tougher and more threatening than anything he has used in public, Secretary Baker this evening seemed to be pointing the troops he visited toward war, perhaps as early as next week if Saddam Hussein does not back down. He spoke to the men and women who fly and service the F-111 bombers that will probably be in the first waves if there is combat. Baker said he fears Saddam Hussein will try to stall as the crisis slides to the brink. And our worry is that in his usual style, he will simply miscalculate where the brink is. And just so there is no misunderstanding whatsoever, let me be absolutely clear with all of you. We pass the brink at midnight on January 15th. Baker said he could not yet tell the troops when a decision would be made about whether they would have to fight. But I can tell you this, you will not have to wait much longer for an answer to that question. The Iraqi president declared that Americans will be devoured by his forces, that he is not frightened by the more than half million troops opposing him and he is certain he will achieve victory against them. 
death is certain, life is not. You know, uh, people are here to do a job, not to, if you're here to draw a paycheck, then you're in the wrong service, you're in the wrong job. Nearly two million American men and women have volunteered for a job in the military. Join the army to, you know, venture out of life and to travel around the world. Private Creel is a minority on that one. 94% of those who enlist in the service are high school graduates who are having difficulty in a shrinking job market. I just finished up with school and was looking for a job. Uncle Sam gave me one, I guess. More than half of those who have enlisted come from families in the lower income brackets. In a recent Army survey, 65% of those questioned said they joined for the opportunity of a better life when their four years of service was up. They weren't thinking about war. Uh, to learn a trade. Mainly because they paid for all my college education. Women who make up half the general population only make up 11% of the enlisted military, perhaps because they are legally barred from combat rules, and thus their chance for advancement is limited. Black Americans make up 12% of the general population, but 23% of the military, and 28% of the ground forces currently in the Persian Gulf. Some black leaders worry that because so many blacks volunteered for the economic or educational benefits, an inordinate number of blacks may die on the battlefield. Everybody's benefited during peacetime. If we should get into a war, then the cost of that war, the burdens of that war, will not be equally borne. The gentleman yields. A couple of examples. Of the 535 members of the U.S. Congress, only two have sons serving in Saudi Arabia. We surveyed 20 major American corporations. Not one CEO had a son or daughter in the military. At ease. Okay, listen up. We're going to carry out some word today. Some Americans feel the draft should be reinstated to restore social balance in the military and possibly affect political decision making. Without a military that uh, reflects all elements of your society, and particularly the elites in your society, there is a much greater danger that the American military will be used in adventures that are not clearly in the national interest. For now, whether they anticipated war or not, they are all volunteers. You know, I signed a contract. I joined on my own free will. I knew this might happen, so, you know, I'd go where I'm told to go, do what I have to do. Good afternoon. It's Carol Simpson in Washington. It's been an historic day on Capitol Hill as both the Senate and House of Representatives have voted to authorize a President of the United States to use military force. In this case, the authority goes to President Bush to take whatever action he deems necessary in the Persian Gulf to get Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. The vote in the Senate was a relatively close 52 to 47, but the margin in the House of Representatives was 250 to 183. Not since Pearl Harbor had With Congress come this close to a formal declaration of war, recorded. first in the Senate. On this vote, the yeas are 52, and the nays are 47. And then in the House. And the joint resolution is adopted. The president got his authorization to do what he feels is necessary when he thinks appropriate. It was a moment to remember after a grim and somber debate. This is a declaration of war. For God's sake, remember, the choice is not whether we have to go to war. It is whether we have to go to war now. Give us more time. Do we save lives by waiting six months or waiting a year? Outside the Capitol, hundreds of demonstrators gathered to protest the inevitable. All but one, that is. While inside, knowing they could not stop the resolution for war, those who opposed it spoke of those who would fight it. You are our own. We draw strength from your courage. And we will stand by you. In this city, in this place, history is so commonplace that it sometimes goes unnoticed. But not today. Today, the world, in a manner of speaking, was watching the Congress of the United States. And now the world waits to see what this Congress has wrought. 
President Bush abruptly flew all the way back from Camp David just to publicly thank Congress for its vote of support in what he called a critical moment in history. This action by the Congress unmistakably demonstrates the United States commitment to the international demand for a complete and unconditional withdrawal of Iraq from Kuwait. This clear expression of the Congress represents the last best chance for peace. For the first time, President Bush indicated he would not use military force after January 15th if it was clear Saddam had at least begun a serious withdrawal of troops. If he started now to do that's what, that what he should have done weeks ago, uh, clearly that would make a difference. And I'm talking about a rapid, massive uh, withdrawal from Kuwait. Tonight, President Bush is finally satisfied the U.S. government is speaking with one voice on Gulf policy. And in the three days left before the U.N. deadline, he'll be listening for any sounds of change in the voice from Baghdad. Pictures of a war machine shifting into high gear. Well, you can really see a change this past week. On the ground and in the air, troops are moving north toward Kuwait to the battlefield while new forces still arrive from the states. I volunteered to come here. I felt that this is where I want to be. If the country needs us to take care of what we need to do. The most destructive array of military power ever assembled is poising to strike. No question in my mind at all that we're going to really kick some butt. We're going to do real well. The point of the spear, the F-15 Eagle, the match of any fighter in the air. These planes will be among the first to challenge the Iraqis. They've trained to return to base only for fast pit stops. We can probably reload an airplane, fuel him, and get him back in the air quicker than you can change oil in your car. Clear the ping! Be clear! On the last day before the deadline, the 82nd Airborne armed their Apache helicopters and scrawled notes on the Hellfire missiles they hope will save American lives. It's just our little message to Iraq, you know, letting them know that we're ready to do whatever we're called upon to do. Those untrained in war are preparing too, learning how to survive chemical attacks and stocking supplies for an uncertain future. Only a few have simply packed up and headed for the hills. The line in the sand, the one that President Bush drew in August. We knew right from the beginning where it was. It was along the border between Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. We were never quite so sure about the when. When exactly was the deadline? UN Resolution 678 says that Iraq should be out of Kuwait on or before January the 15th. But which midnight? Tonight or tomorrow? And who's midnight? After leaving it deliberately fuzzy at first, the White House now wants there to be no mistake. The Bush administration says it is midnight tomorrow night, Washington time, 8 a.m. on Wednesday morning in Iraq and Kuwait. that God can intervene. I old enough to remember World War II and Korea and Vietnam and all. And prayer does sustain people. We didn't have to go to war, but, um, you know, I'm just scared, that's all. No white boy! No white boy! No white boy! No white boy! The Department of Defense is ready to execute any order we might receive from the President. We're hoping that Everything will work out for the best, and we get home safe and sound. It obviously is a moment of uh, considerable gravity for anybody who's involved in government, whether it's the president or those of us in the Defense Department or uh, the members of Congress. I am going to be praying that someone in the Iraqi army shoots Saddam Hussein in the back, to be honest. He's the one that's got this whole thing, and that my dad is over there for no reason. This is a truly 
very dangerous situation. We are fully prepared for confrontation. And we shall teach the United States administration a hard lesson. We are ready with our allies to do whatever is necessary to implement the resolutions of the United Nations in full. Whatever happens, happens. We're all motivated and ready to do what we're here to do. I don't see any hope barring a uh, miracle for a major and extremely destructive war in the Gulf area to be avoided. Is it by you at all? A little.